The hearing will come to order. This is a hearing, a uh, joint hearing, and I'm, I'm proud to have uh, my colleagues uh, uh, from the uh, Committee on Oversight and Government Reform uh, joining us in this joint uh, uh, hearing, Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations Committee of the Financial Services and the Subcommittee on TARP Financial Services Bailouts of Public and Private Programs in the Committee uh, of the Committee on Oversight and uh, Government Reform. Uh, We'll remind all members uh, that we may have some members that uh, want to join without uh, any objection. We may have some other members of the committee, Financial Services Committee, that may want to join uh, after the votes. Just kind of lay out the plan for everybody. We're going to try to get the opening statements um, out of the way here. I think there will be a vote shortly. I think there's two votes, I believe, or something like that. We'll go do those uh, quickly and then come back and uh, begin uh, the hearing. Uh, all, without objection, all members' opening statements will be made uh, a part uh, of the uh, record. Today we, we're having this hearing uh, in order to uh, look into matters at the SEC uh, on uh, how ethics uh, and uh, things that are uh, handled within the organization. Uh, the Inspector General has just released a report and he will go over uh, that. I think one of the things that's alarming about uh, this this hearing today is that uh, the SEC uh, really holds the entities that they regulate to very high standards, particularly when it comes to conflict of interest. Uh, and I think it is extremely important that the organization that holds others uh, to be uh, to these standards must have those same standards uh, within their organization. Uh, and as we look at the Inspector General's report, I uh, think there were some holes uh, in that system. Uh, and uh, one of the things we're here today is to discuss that. I think it is alarming to uh, find out that uh, someone that may have had a financial interest uh, in uh, the Madoff uh, settlement uh, was actually handling uh, some, many of the very high-level discussions that were going on uh, at the SEC. Uh, and uh, many of us believe that that was probably not uh, appropriate behavior. Uh, as we move forward with this, I think one of the things we have to understand is that uh, the, uh, we, the SEC is uh, entrusted to protect shareholders and investors, uh, and that uh, some of the behavior that was going on within the organization uh, would be probably behavior that would not be tolerated, you know, uh, by some of the companies uh, and entities uh, and individuals that fall under the SEC's uh, jurisdiction. Uh, ultimately, uh, I think what w the findings uh, of the Inspector General, as we'll hear, is that there was some lapses uh, and that uh, there are some changes that need to be made uh, within the organization uh, and that, uh, the, that the leadership of this, uh, on this issue really needs to come from the very top uh, and we look forward to hearing uh, from Ms. Shapiro on some of the things that uh, her reflections on the report uh, and things that uh, she thinks that uh, need to be happening uh, within her organization to uh, moving forward to make sure these kinds of issues uh, do not happen uh, in, in the future. Uh, and I think there's a high expectation that uh, this issue be dealt with. Uh, and that uh, hopefully the things like this don't happen again because uh, this was a very high-profile case to begin with uh, and uh, had a lot of attention to the Madoff issue uh, and then to uh, kind of follow up and find out that uh, within the organization then we were having lapses in, in uh, other internal control areas was, was uh, somewhat disturbing for a lot of us. So uh, I look forward to this hearing today. Uh, and, and now it's uh, my ple pleasure to uh, uh, yield uh, two minutes uh, to uh, the gentleman, Mr. Capiano, ranking member. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to welcome the uh, people going to give testimony today, the members of the panel. Uh, thank you for being here, and thank you for your patience with uh, our schedule and the demands of our schedule, um, which I know you both know. Um, obviously, I want to know more about this particular incident, but I've read the report, and I actually think it's pretty clear. I, We'll find it surprising if you shed additional light, but maybe. Uh, but I'm, for me, when these things happen, everybody makes mistakes. Even I have made an occasional mistake uh, or have interpreted something wrong or applied something wrong. And that's one way to judge people. And if it's all about perfection, 
um, then let anyone who wants to stand up and be perfect. Uh, that is one part of the judgment, though. How bad was it? Did innocent people get hurt? And if they did, uh, what was it? But the other part of the judgment is also to find out what has happened since the problem came to light. What's been the reaction? Has the reaction been proper? Has it been appropriately timed? Uh, have innocent people been protected? Uh, have any wrong uh, decisions made in the, in the wrong path? Have they been corrected? And again, I think I know some of these answers, but nonetheless, I'd like to hear them today. Uh, because to me, that's the real judgment. Is making a mistake is one thing. But how you react to the mistake, to me, is usually more important. And I, and I look forward to uh, hearing this testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. I'm also uh, pleased to have the chairman of, uh, of the uh, uh, Oversight and Government Reform joining us on the panel as well. Mr. Issa, we appreciate uh, you being here. And now I yield uh, three minutes uh, to the chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. McHenry, who I look forward to working with on this, this hearing. And thanks for your cooperation. Thank you, and uh, thank you for this joint hearing today. Uh, and I want to thank our panel for, for being here and complying with our schedule. I, I certainly appreciate that. And I want to thank you both for your service in government. Um, in May 2010, then-ranking member Daryl Issa released a report that it explained how the SEC's unworkable structure, lawyer-driven culture, and technological backwardness helped to cause one of its high-profile failures, such as the Madoff scandal. This joint committee hearing continues ongoing efforts of congressional oversight. The matter at hand today originates with Bernie Madoff's elaborate Ponzi scheme. Mr. Madoff admitted, admitted guilt nearly a decade after questions had been raised to regulators about the Madoff firm, which operated a Ponzi scheme with, other, uh, with over $60 billion of fraud and thousands of clients. It was clear the SEC's reputation had taken a blow. In 2009, Mary Shapiro was named chairman of the SEC and stated her commitment to build, rebuild the SEC's reputation. Soon after her arrival, she welcomed back David Becker to the, FEC, uh, to the SEC as general counsel. Upon arriving at the SEC in early 2009, Mr. Becker informed uh, Chairman Shapiro about his status as a net winner from the Madoff fraud case. Despite learning this, Chairman Shapiro never asked Mr. Becker to recuse himself from Madoff-related matters or to disclose his financial interest. This was unfortunate, and this was a mistake. That's now clear. Since then, a series of missteps uh, by high-ranking officials at the SEC, ranging from uh, Mr. Becker's communication with SEC's counsel to his personal participation in matters in which he had a personal financial interest, have put into question the reputation of the management and decision-making of the SEC. That's what this hearing is really about. We also know, for example, that the SEC's five commissioners, advised by Mr. Becker, voted on an issue that affected uh, Mr. Becker's personal financial interest, and only Chairman Shapiro knew about that, and perhaps not to the full extent that she now does. Just yesterday, the SEC's Inspector General referred the Becker situation case to the Department of Justice. Well, Chairman Shapiro, you've had a distinguished career. You've had a long service and government service, um, and we certainly appreciate that. We appreciate your contribution to federal service. You have a wonderful reputation. What is clear about this situation is that you did make a mistake. You admitted such, and you said, had you known then what you now know, you would have acted differently. What we want to know in terms of federal congressional oversight is how we prevent this from happening again what policies you're going to put in place, what actions you have taken, and what actions you'll take going forward to make sure this never happens again. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your service. I thank the gentleman. And uh, now I yield uh, two and a half minutes to the gentleman, Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, earlier this year, this subcommittee held a hearing, a uh, similar hearing on the SEC. Uh, at that hearing, we acknowledge a number of issues facing the SEC, including budget cuts and the ability of SEC to complete its responsibilities after they're, they're done. We also discussed internal challenges, including the David Becker potential uh, conflict of interest in handling high-profile cases. Uh, but at that time, at our last hearing, we didn't have the benefit of the extensive record that we do now, thanks to the Inspector General's report. In order to fairly address this important issue and restore the public's confidence in the SEC, we welcome a thorough discussion of these matters. To that end, we also welcome the voluntary appearance of David Becker and hope his testimony will advance our discussion. 
This case, this case exemplifies how even the appearance of impropriety can undermine public confidence in vital institutions like the SEC. According to the Inspector General, quote, Becker participated personally and substantially in particular matters in which he had a personal financial interest. That demonstrates the importance of transparency and of ethical decision making in the agency process, an imperative for objective, independent and competent ethics counsel at all government agencies. In closing, I look forward to this discussion as well as our consideration of the Inspector General's recommendations for reforming the SEC's ethics office. I would also like to observe that Chairman Shapiro deserves credit for steps she has already taken to deal with this issue and future issues. Uh, she called for the Inspector General's investigation and has moved to revamp the SEC's ethics office. I hope we can build on her work and help restore trust in the SEC, a vital public institution that is critical to the soundness of our financial markets. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman and now the uh, chairman of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, Mr. Issa, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for convening this joint hearing today. It is, in fact, always a pleasure to see the chairwoman. Uh, we, we consider her to be a consummate professional who, as uh, Chairman McHenry said, has made a mistake. Also, I would like to welcome uh, General Coates. Your report is important to the reform that this joint group wants to do. I recognize that although the reform is in the name of our committee, uh, ultimately a great deal of what is going to be done, overseen and fixed will be under financial services. We are deeply concerned that we have now had two strikes on Bernie Madoff, that in fact today many of my questions will be not only how did it happen, but how are we going to make sure we don't have a third? It is extremely important that this committee, this joint effort, begin looking and saying how do we get the maximum confidence in the process? How do we get capital moving again? Because ultimately dollars sitting on the sideline is in fact a national problem and there is no better place to ensure the confidence comes back than to our public market. So I look forward to the hearing. It is going to be tough. There are going to be tough questions because mistakes were made. But, Mr. Chairman, as you know, uh, our committee is also working on Fast and Furious with a different part of government in which they are still claiming that no problem really occurred, that it was simply a botched uh, operation. This was not a botched operation. There were mistakes made that we have to ensure do not happen in the future as a process, not just for individuals. So I thank you for holding this hearing, and I look forward to the question and answer. And yield back. I thank the gentleman. And uh, now I'm going to yield uh, one minute to gentleman Mr. Lynch. Is he not? Okay. Mr. Um, to, oh, I'm sorry. To uh, Mr. Cummings, Pardon, excuse me for that. It's two and a half minutes. Thank you very much. Recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling today's hearing, and I welcome the opportunity to work with the members of the Hollis Financial Services Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee on this very important issue. The IG report, uh, which uh, I commend Chairman Shapiro for requesting, clearly describes a procedural breakdown within the SEC's ethics process that undermines the public's trust, not just in the Madoff matter but also in any other matter before the Commission. This is simply unacceptable. The victims of the Madoff scheme deserve to know that the SEC's decision in this case was not tainted by conflicts of interest. I am heartened by reports that Chairman Chairwoman Shapiro has already adopted the IG's recommendations to revisit the SEC's position regarding the method used to calculate the value of each Madoff victim's accounts, a method that was advanced by Mr. Becker and adopted by the SEC. I am also encouraged that Chairman, Chairwoman Shapiro took action last year to overhaul the Ethics Office, hire a new Ethics Council, and provide the office with greater resources. However, I, like other members of this panel, continue to have grave concerns and serious questions about the procedural breakdown in the SEC's ethics process. And it is so important that we establish trust uh, and reestablish trust in this very important office. Uh, Mr. Shapiro, you have said it yourself that trust is very, very important for everything you do. There are so many Americans that are depending on this office to do the right thing. And they have to know that things are functioning the way they are supposed to function. And so I look forward to your testimony 
And uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I yield back and look forward to the testimony. Uh, I thank the gentleman. And uh, Mr. Lynch is not here. Ms. Maloney, for one minute. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking members for calling this important uh, hearing on the potential conflicts of interest at the SEC and the Becker case. This is an important case, but even more important than this is steps we can take to prevent a Bernie Madoff scheme from happening again and hurting American taxpayers. And uh, Dodd-Frank implemented a strengthened uh, public accounting board, strengthened independent auditors uh, because the information and the accounts were fraudulent in the, in the Madoff case. It strengthened whistleblower protections. It lowered the aiding and abetting standard. And it strengthened the requirement that examiners talk to law enforcement in order uh, to move forward. I, I agree very much with the IG's recommendation that the, uh, the vote should be reconsidered in a process that is free from any possible bias or taint. And I look forward from hearing from you, Mrs. Shapiro, uh, what steps you're taking to ensure that this time the Madoff victims and the American people can be confident that this process is untainted and unbiased. Our markets run more on trust than on capital, and restoring trust is extremely important. This is an important hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank the gentlewoman. Uh, our first panel is the Honorable Mary Shapiro, and she's the chairman of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, and Mr. David Kotz, the Inspector General, U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, without objection, your written statements will be made a part of the record, and you will be recognized for five minutes to summarize your testimony. Um, Ms. Shapiro. Chairman Nogbauer, um, McHenry, ranking members Capuano and Quigley, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify regarding the report of the Securities and Exchange Commission's Inspector General concerning the Commission's former general counsel, David Becker. Last March, I requested the IG conduct this review. I wanted to ensure that there was an independent analysis of all relevant facts surrounding Mr. Becker's involvement in commission matters relating to CIPIC's liquidation of the Madoff broker-dealer. Among other things, the IG, IG identifies concerns about Mr. Becker's participation in the commission's resolution of those issues and also makes a number of recommendations, several of which propose ways to improve the commission's already much improved ethics office. The Commission's new Ethics Council and I concur in those recommendations and agree on the need to take immediate steps to implement them. The IG also has indicated he will refer or has referred the results of his investigation to the Department of Justice. While it would be inappropriate for me to comment on that referral, I can talk about what I recall of Mr. Becker's communications to me soon after I became chairman in January of 2009. Mr. Becker informed me that his mother had had an account with Madoff before she died and that it had been closed a number of years before he returned to the agency. At the time, I was focused on identifying and remediating failures in the agency that had allowed the fraud to go undetected for many years. And I was focused on the plight of the many victims, some of whose heartbreaking letters I had recently read. It simply did not occur to me then that his deceased mother's account, closed years ago, could present a financial conflict of interest. There were a number of important facts about Mr. Becker's situation that I did not either know or appreciate at the time, principally that he personally could be subject to a clawback suit or that the resolution of the CIPIC issues affecting the victims of the Madoff fraud could potentially affect his financial interest. What I did know was that Mr. Becker was a dedicated public servant and experienced attorney who had ably served as general counsel under three chairmen. As compliance with ethical obligations is each employee's responsibility, I assume that he would seek guidance from the agency's Ethics Council, and indeed the IG report describes how Mr. Becker did that on two separate occasions. But while I understand that Mr. Becker did obtain clearance from the Ethics Council, I also realize that as chairman, I need to have a broader vision that goes beyond what may be required in any particular situation. On such matters, I need to be acutely sensitive to any issue that could potentially distract from the Commission's ability to fulfill its mission with the full confidence of the investing public. I was sworn in as chairman on January 27, 2009, a month and a half after Madoff was arrested. My highest priority at that time 
was to make whatever changes were needed to ensure that another Madoff could never happen again. But I was equally concerned about how to provide the most effective relief for the Madoff victims so that, within the contours of the law, we could get the most money to investors who were literally losing their homes. That issue crystallized for the Commission around the question of how the bankruptcy court presiding over the liquidation should calculate the net equity in a Madoff victim's account. In December 2009, after internal discussions and a vote, the Commission expressed its position to the bankruptcy court. The Commission's position had two components. First, the Commission determined that due to the nature of Madoff's fraud, customers' net equity could not be based on the fictitious amounts shown on their final account statements. Instead, they should be measured by their net investment with Madoff, the money in, money out approach. Second, given the extraordinary duration of the fraud, the Commission concluded that the way to treat different generations of victims most fairly was to adjust their claims to account for the effects of inflation over time, what we call the constant dollar approach. The bankruptcy court has ruled on the first question, agreeing with the money in, money out approach, a decision that the Second Circuit Court of Appeals recently affirmed. The bankruptcy court, however, has not yet addressed whether the customer's claims should be measured in constant dollars. The IG recommends that the Commission conduct a revote on its determination that Madoff customer net equity be calculated in constant dollars. I agree that a reanalysis and a revote of this issue is appropriate. The report also discusses a decision in late 2009 to have a witness other than Mr. Becker testify on behalf of the Commission at a congressional hearing concerning the Commission's views on how net equity should be determined in Madoff. The witness at that hearing was there to represent the Commission's legal and policy position on a complex, novel question of law. When this issue arose, I believed were Mr. Becker to be the witness, he should disclose to the subcommittee that his mother had had an account. Thereafter, it was suggested to me that notwithstanding Mr. Becker's clearance by Ethics Council, his participation could distract from the core legal and policy positions of the Commission and that therefore our deputy solicitor, an experienced litigator, and the principal attorney on the Madoff liquidation matters should be the Commission's witness, and I concurred. Ensuring that the agency has the strongest possible ethics program has been a priority of mine. Over the past two years, we have revamped the structure, function, and personnel of the Commission's ethics office. The IG report makes recommendations on ways to further improve our ethics program including having the Chief Ethics Counsel report directly to the Chairman instead of to the General Counsel. Notwithstanding the improvements we already have made, I recognize there is more that can be done and we will take immediate steps to implement the report's recommendations. I am proud of how much we have accomplished at the SEC over the past two and a half years, and I am proud to have the opportunity to work alongside an extraordinary staff who work tirelessly to protect investors in the markets. Critical to the performance of our mission is protecting the integrity and the perception of integrity of our decisions and our processes. I can say to you with assuredness that we have learned from this experience and are taking and will continue to take all actions necessary to earn and maintain the trust the public places in us. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. And Mr. Koch, thank you. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittees on the subject of potential conflicts of interest with the SEC, the Becker case, as the Inspector General of the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. On March 4, 2011, Chairman Shapiro requested that my office investigate any conflicts of interest arising from the participation of David Becker, the former General Counsel and Senior Policy Director of the Commission, in determining the SEC's position in the liquidation proceeding brought by the Securities Investor Protection Corporation, SIPC, of Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities the Madoff liquidation. The Chairman's request came after she received congressional inquiries prompted by press reports beginning on February 22, 2011, that the trustee administering the Madoff liquidation had brought a clawback suit seeking to recover fictitious profits that had accrued to Mr. Becker and his brother as beneficiaries of their mother's estate when a Madoff account she held was liquidated after her death. We opened an investigation that same day we received the Chairman's request. During the course of our investigation, we obtained and searched over 5.1 million emails for a total of 45 current and former SEC employees for various time periods pertinent to the investigation, ranging from 1998 to 2011. We also obtained and analyzed internal SEC documents 
documentation provided by the Madoff trustee, court filings, and press reports. In addition, we conducted testimony or interviews of 40 witnesses with knowledge of relevant facts or circumstances surrounding the matter. On September 16, 2011, we issued to the chairman of the SEC a comprehensive report of our investigation in the conflict of interest matter that contained nearly 120 pages of analysis and 200 exhibits. Overall, the OIG investigation found that Mr. Becker participated personally and substantially in particular matters in which he had a personal financial interest by virtue of the inheritance of the proceeds of his mother's estate's Madoff account and that the matters on which he advised could have directly impacted his financial position. We found that Mr. Becker played a significant and leading role in the determination of what recommendation the staff would make to the Commission regarding the position the SEC would advocate as to the calculation of a customer's net equity in the Madoff liquidation. Under the Securities Investors Protection Act of 1970, SIPA, where SIPC has initiated the liquidation of a brokerage firm, net equity is the amount that a customer can claim to recover in the liquidation proceeding. The method for determining the Madoff customer's net equity was therefore critical to determining the amount the trustee would pay to customers in the Madoff liquidation. Testimony obtained from SIPC officials and numerous SEC witnesses, as well as documentary evidence reviewed, demonstrated that there was a direct connection between the method used to determine net equity and clawback actions by the trustee, including the overall amount of funds the trustee would seek to claw back and the calculation of amounts sought in individual clawback suits. In addition to Mr. Becker's work on the net equity issue, we also found that Mr. Becker, in his role as SEC General Counsel and Senior Policy Director, provided comments on a proposed amendment to SIPA that would have severely curtailed the trustee's power to bring clawback suits against individuals like him in the Madoff liquidation. After we concluded the fact-finding phase of our investigation, we provided to the Acting Director of the Office of Government Ethics, OGE, a summary of the salient facts uncovered in the investigation as reflected in our report. After reviewing the summary of facts we provided, the Acting Director of OEG OGE advised us that in his opinion, as well as that of senior attorneys on his staff, Mr. Becker's work, both on the policy determination of the calculation of net equity in connection with clawback actions stemming from the Madoff matter, and his work on the proposed legislation affecting clawbacks should be referred to the United States Department of Justice for consideration of whether Mr. Becker violated 18 U.S.C. Section 208, a criminal conflict of interest provision. Based on this guidance from OGE, we have referred the results of our investigation to the Public Integrity Section of the Criminal Division of the United States Department of Justice. Based on the findings in our report, we have also recommended that in light of David Becker's role in signing an advice memorandum, and participating in an executive session at which the Commission considered the recommendation that the Commission take the position that net equity for purposes of paying Madoff customer claims should be calculated in constant dollars by adjusting for the effects of inflation, that the Commission should reconsider its position on this issue by conducting a revote in a process free from any possible bias or taint. We have also made several recommendations with respect to the Ethics Office, including that the SEC Ethics Council should report directly to the Chairman rather than to the General Counsel, and that necessary steps, including the implementation of appropriate policies and procedures, be taken to ensure that, one, objective, complete, and consistent ethics advice is provided. Two, ethics officials have all the necessary information in order to properly determine if an employee's proposed actions may violate rules or statutes or create an appearance of impropriety. And three, all ethics advice provided in significant matters, such as those involving financial conflict of interest, are documented in an appropriate and consistent manner. I'm confident that under Chairman Shapiro's leadership, the SEC will review our report and take appropriate steps to implement our recommendations to ensure that the concerns identified in our investigation are appropriately addressed. I also believe the fact that the Chairman asked my office to conduct this investigation, and we completed an exhaustive investigation and issued a thorough and comprehensive report in a timely fashion demonstrates that the Inspector General process within the SEC is working effectively. In conclusion, I appreciate the interest of the Chairman, the Ranking Members, and the Subcommittee in the SEC and my office, and in particular in the facts and circumstances pertinent to our Conflict of Interest report. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll now go to uh, questions from the members. And uh, each member will be recognized for five minutes, recognize myself for five minutes. Ms. Shapiro, uh, you advised Mr. Becker that uh, he would have to disclose his interest uh, in the Madoff interest if uh, he uh, testified before Congress, uh, 
but you didn't feel it was necessary to disclose information before uh, the commission, when the commission, uh, Mr. Becker, made a presentation on the, 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 his proposed uh, uh, formula for uh, the liquidation. I, I'm a little, I was a little confused why you felt like it was important that he disclose that to Congress, but not disclose it to your, your, your commission members. Can, can you shed some light on that for me? I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Um, I thought it was very important that any information be disclosed um, to Congress in the context of, of his potentially being a witness so there would not be any surprises. Um, it did not, he, he apparently did not tell the commissioners and it did not frankly occur to me um, to direct him to tell the commissioners because generally it's not our practice to tell the commission or to talk about it when somebody does not have a conflict of interest and ethics having cleared that he did not have a conflict of interest from appearing, he did not need to recuse. And so um, we generally haven't told people um, when somebody is not recused. I wish that he had told them. Um, and after we all learned, obviously, um, from reading the newspaper, that he had, in fact, been sued in a clawback suit, um, and was we, myself included, very surprised by this news, I did go to each commissioner and in fact apologized to them for not having thought to direct David to do exactly that and inform them of it. But it simply was because we just don't have a practice of telling people when somebody's not recused. Well, I think, I think that's one of the issues about this hearing is it's, it's some of these practices that were in place at the commission that, that seemed to be the problem. And, and there wasn't that much distance uh, in, in time between when the commission voted and when Mr. Becker was, was asked to potentially, you know, testify before Congress. And so in, in, a, in a short period of time, we had an epiphany here that, oh, maybe we should start telling people uh, about this. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I think uh, uh, Commissioner Aguilar was, uh, you know, expressed extreme, I think is incredibly disappointed was the words he used, that uh, uh, he was not made aware of the conflict that existed in, uh, in that. And so uh, I think that, that that's, you know, some of the things we're talking about today is that we're going to hear people say, well, it didn't seem important. But, you know, when you, you did mention that, you know, when you originally reached out to Mr. Becker, he disclosed uh, that to you. Uh, you had just been made uh, the uh, uh, SEC uh, chairman of, uh, and at a time when, uh, you know, a very high-profile case was something you knew you had to address, and and yet the one of the people that you brought into a senior staff position was someone that said, you know what, I, I may have a conflict here. Uh, I, you know, my, my family had a, 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 an account with uh, Madoff, and, and so I guess the the question is is uh, who did you make the decision to to pull Mr. Becker as as the witness uh, when he was going to testify? Um, Mr. Chairman, the um, decision um, about who would testify was actually made by our Legislative Affairs Office, but I did concur in it. The staff came to the conclusion that um, it could potentially be a distraction to have this disclosure, even though it had been cleared by ethics, it was a public forum, it was likely to be um, take, divert attention from the really important technical legal issues that the subcommittee was trying to explore uh, at that hearing. In addition, uh, Mr. Becker had never testified, and I think there were some concerns about whether he would be a very good witness. We had a second great choice in our um, deputy solicitor who was, in fact, deeply involved in the Madoff um, litigation issues. And I believe that, I, and so I was comfortable with David Becker being the witness so long as it was disclosed, but I was also comfortable with the determination that he might not be the best witness and our goal was to put the best witness in front of Congress to explain the Commission's legal and policy analysis. I, I'm, I'm just curious why you weren't comfortable s saying to Mr. Becker, you, you know, when you make your presentation to the c Commission, uh, you know, I mean, if it's relevant for uh, a person that's testifying before Congress, I would think it's also the, the, these commissioners, uh, y'all are charged with making very important decisions. Why it wasn't relevant for you to disclose that or for Mr. Becker to disclose that uh, to the commission members uh, when he made his presentation? Of, of course, and had I thought of it, I would have directed him to do that. It just, it didn't occur to me. I was thinking about this context of the testimony, and I wasn't thinking separately about the context of disclosing it to the commissioners. 
Um, there certainly was no intention to hide it, and I wish it had been disclosed. And that's one reason why I think it is important that we go ahead and do a reanalysis and, and retake the vote so that there can be no question before the court actually considers this issue um, about whether there was any taint to the decision. Thank you. My time has expired. Mr. Capiano. Thank, thank you, Ms. Shannon. Uh, Mr. Kotz, um, did you make specific enumerated suggestions uh, on uh, how to address the problems that you found? Yes, yes, we did. We had, uh, as indicated, we first uh, had the recommendation that the entire Uh, that the entire process be reconsidered and that a revote be taken so that I mean did you make a, a, a number of specific recommendations yes and how many how many recommendations did you make approximately do you know uh, four separate recommendations we made three separate recommendations with respect to the ethics office and then a recommendation overall about the process so four specific recommendations uh, was it usually the way these things work did you make a recommendation in uh, not you, but any IG makes a recommendation and whoever they're recommending to has a response. Uh, was there any disagreement with any of the recommendations you made? No, I mean, we follow up. We ask for actually a corrective action plan to demonstrate that the recommendations have been implemented. But in this case, the chairman has already indicated that she plans to implement the recommendations. Okay, so to your knowledge, everything you recommended has either been done or is being done? Correct. Uh, do you have any plans to do a follow-up to that uh, a month, six months, a year from now to see if they have, in fact, been implemented? We, we may do a follow-up to look at the ethics office overall. Uh, you know, it, it will depend on the information we get about the recommendations being implemented. But if there's any question about the complete and full implementation of the recommendations, we will follow up. Uh, Ms. Shapiro, would you have any objections to a follow-up again six months or a year from now or whatever? No, I would actually welcome it because we've made some very significant changes in our ethics office, and I think it would be very valuable to have the IG's perception of whether those are um, effective and, and the appropriate changes to have made. Thank you. Uh, honestly, again, obviously there was mistakes made. We all know that. We, I actually commend you, Madam Chair, for uh, accepting the fact that you made mistakes. I, it's hard to do. I've done it. It's hard to do. Um, at the same time, I also commend you and we commend you, Mr. Koss, for making positive recommendations out of a bad situation. Uh, and hopefully this will be better. And my hope, my expectation is that not only will the process be better, but the implementation of the process. Have the best processes in the world if they're not implemented properly and they're not taken seriously, uh, not just at the SEC, but anywhere, uh, they're worthless. So, uh, I, I, again, I, uh, that's what I came for, is I came to here to make sure that there seems to be no malice here. I mean, there seems to be screw-ups. Okay, but it seems to be that the screw-ups have been addressed and they're being addressed, and I would strongly suggest, Mr. Koss, that you do a follow-up, even if you don't think it's necessary. Okay. Um, if the chairwoman has no problem, and whether she's the chairwoman a year, a year from now, who knows, but if not you, then your successor, do the follow-up, even if it's a one-page follow-up saying everything's great, okay. or if it's a one-page follow-up that says nothing's been done. Uh, it'll make certainly make me feel better, and I think uh, maybe hopefully it'll put a uh, a final period at the end of this particular issue. Okay, thank we will do that. that. Uh, I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and now Mr. McHenry is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you for your testimony, and uh, Chairman Shapiro, thank you for uh, the work that you've rendered to your government and uh, your service. Um, but as I said, this is an unfortunate situation, but there are a few things that are uh, that we have in terms of uh, what appeared to happen. I just want to confirm that, that those are in fact the case, so you can answer how you see fit. But when Mr. Becker returned to government service in about February of 2009, um, he disclosed that uh, his late mother's account was in fact a Madoff account. D did you ask him to recuse himself from Madoff related issues at that time? No, I didn't. Why? Because he had told me that his mother had had an account years ago, that she had passed away five or six years before he returned to the commission. I don't remember exact number. The account had been closed. It seemed to me to be so very remote to anything we were working on at that time. And if I can give you a little context, I just arrived in an agency that was in disarray, quite honestly, and deeply demoralized. We are coming out of a financial crisis. There were a thousand things to do. There was virtually no senior staff on board. Um, and I was focused on lots of other things, and I was also focused on 
trying to get the maximum amount of, of allowable recovery to victims who had nothing, who had lost everything, not people whose accounts had been closed five or six years before, but people who were literally moving into their children's basements because they lost their homes because of what this man did. And I was not thinking about David Becker's deceased mother's account through any of this. I assumed, as an experienced government lawyer, he would go to the ethics office, he would do what needed to be done, uh, and make a decision um, about his participation. But honestly, it seemed so remote to me to, to the issues that the agency was facing at that moment coming out of the failure to stop the Madoff Ponzi scheme. And, and you understand the account valuation method would determine how these clawbacks would function. And you also knew that he, he, he had an account that could possibly be subject to clawbacks. Not, Why didn't not, you ask him to recuse himself at that time? Sir, not really then did I understand that. I wasn't, I, I know this seems, at that time we weren't thinking about people whose accounts had been closed years before. We were thinking about people who were in extremis right at that moment who needed to have um, funds um, returned to them as best they could be done um, as a result of the fraud. So I wasn't connecting clawbacks um, to the issues we were facing at that particular moment, and I certainly wasn't thinking about um, what was going on with, with his, again, deceased mother's account from years before. Okay. It, I just wasn't connecting those dots, and I didn't have that kind of information. Frankly, I didn't even know what was, how much was in the account, whether it had you know, earned a lot of money, a lot of money had been taken out. I just didn't have that kind of detail, and, and certainly I didn't know that he could be subject or that count could be subject to a clawback at that time. But according to the, the notes that were part of this report, you in fact did know about this. Is that correct, Mr. Cox? Uh, well, uh, our uh, report showed that when David Becker initially had a conversation with Chairman Shapiro, it wasn't necessarily clear that he told her that he could be subject to a clawback suit. Here. That was some information yeah. that he provided to the Ethics Council. Uh, but June of '09. There are notes that you are aware yes, that it could so affect. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was speaking to the time, uh, I thought you prefaced your question when he came back to the commission in February. And at that time, I made absolutely no connection. Okay. I, I will tell you, though, that those notes reflect a discussion with staff um, in preparation for a meeting with um, the management of CIPIC about the different methodologies that could conceivably be used. Last account statement, money in, money out, money in, money out, and constant dollars. And there is a note that says that clawbacks are not possible under the broader approach, I believe. I, I still will tell you, I wasn't connecting that and hadn't, frankly, thought about his mother's account in many, many months. It was a moment in time um, when he mentioned it to me in February, and I just didn't think of it again in that context. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me ask you a different question, Ms. Shapiro. Have you recused yourself? In your time of pu in public service, have you uh, taken upon yourself to recuse yourself? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you had the judgment to do this, and you assumed that Mr. Becker had the same judgment. Yes, each employee's ethical obligations are their own, and okay. their duty is theirs. And, and here's the challenge. What is the process to put in place to ensure this doesn't happen again? Now, I appreciate the fact you've taken the IG's uh, recommendations and accepted them. What are you going to do going forward to ensure this doesn't happen again? Mr. Chairman, we have a, um, a significantly stronger ethics office today, I believe, than, than maybe at any time uh, in recent history. And In fact, our new chief ethics officer, Shira Pavis Minton, is here with me today. We have new leadership at the highest level of the ethics office. We've donated, uh, allocated additional resources to that function. We have the first chief compliance officer ever at the SEC. Uh, operating in that office. We've given, um, we've had a significant expansion of the education of employees and training of employees about these kinds of, of issues. We have a new ethics handbook that's been released to employees, uh, and we have a number of ongoing initiatives um, through the um, ethics office, including much more rigorous and routine consultation with the Office of Government Ethics on issues as they come up so that we're getting a bit broader input into these um, more uh, technical or more difficult decisions. So um, I think across the board we have strengthened this office and we're doing it very much with a goal to pre pre prevent exactly this kind of thing from happening, which distracts us from important work we have to do. 
Thank you. I thank the gentleman, um, Mr. Quigley. You thank you, Mr. Chairman. Five minutes. Well, let me ask that question in a, in a different light. For either one of you, walk us through the scenario of what happened with Mr. Becker and why the new and improved system would catch this before it got this far. At what point and why would the current system, training, education, what have you, have stopped this? His particular instance. Well, I, I might let the um, Inspector General speak to walking through with Mr. Becker. I can say that I believe now somebody coming to the ethics office with a question like this. First of all, I believe my sensitivity um, to the sort of Granted. toxic nature of anything related to this um, is heightened. But even if I don't know about it, and I don't know, we have 3,800 employees. I don't know about everybody's ethical um, calculations that they have to make about whether they can participate in a matter. But going to the ethics office now, when we've centralized all of our ethics guidance under the ethics officer, they would get um, a more collaborative look, uh, much more um, required information and documentation about all of the issues that surround the ethical question. There would be consultation with the Office of Government Ethics about whether it would be appropriate for a person to participate or not participate. There would be documentation of the advice that's given so that if the issue comes up again, um, we can be consistent in, in the advice that's rendered. But when you get put in, I'm sorry, when you get put in a position like his, uh, aren't there written documents about his financial situation and his family so this would be caught automatically? I, I believe that because this was so long ago that, it, I, and I don't know this so I'm surmising, it would not have been um, captured in current financial disclosure documents, but uh, that's not something I'm really And have we altered the financial disclosure documents for, y for your agency, if only, Mr. Cotts, that, w that would get to this sort of thing, recognizing now that the, the recent past may not be far enough back? Yeah, I think that that's, that's a, a very good idea. Um, the other point I would make in terms of how things would be different, implementing our recommendation that the Ethics Council should report directly to the chairman, I think would change things. We had great concerns about the process used where David Becker went to a subordinate and got the advice uh, with respect to whether he had to recuse himself from that matter. Uh, several months later, he performed a performance evaluation of this individual. And so I think that there is a concern about when you have to give ethics advice for your boss, uh, where it's a matter that the person wants to work on. And so if you uh, move that person out of, from under the general counsel, then I think in this case, uh, the ethics official who makes the decision would maybe feel more comfortable giving uh, appropriate advice. I think if that recommendation is implemented, which I understand it will be, that that, that could potentially make a significant difference. You mentioned this is a, a potentially a good idea. How far back do you go now on your current recommendations in a person's financial background who make decisions like Mr. Becker was? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, Office of Government Ethics forms that everyone fills out uh, government-wide, and it, it has uh, current interests that you have for that year, so as long as you continue an interest. Um, I, I think that perhaps since this was his mother's account, uh, you know, the estate's account, that it may not have been picked up for that purpose. That may be something that needs to be looked at to add to the financial disclosure form, because obviously if you're inheriting money, it becomes yours. And right, so and, and, and it may not apply to all government employees, but it's clearly with the decisions like Mr. Becker's, people in those positions may have to have a different sort of form. Yes, so I agree. I mean, there should certainly be a heightened standard for a senior person uh, in an agency like the SEC. You know, the SEC holds itself out. Its, its code uh, holds itself out for the highest level of integrity, and I think that that's an important standard that the SEC has to keep. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Congressman, if I could just add, um, I think one of the important things we can do and it goes back to the comment about setting the tone at the top, is really um, heightening our employees, all of our employees' awareness to the issues of the appearance of impropriety or the appearance issues generally. And, and the current ethics office is very uh, engaged in exactly that kind of, of um, education of our and, and I appreciate that. Mr. Katz, a final point. Your, the recommendation that was made to refer this to the Justice Department, um, that decision, how was it, if at all, influenced by the fact that he had made this decision after getting advice from legal counsel within the SEC? Yeah, so according to the regulation, that is a factor that the Justice Department looks at in determining whether to bring a case, but that's not an absolute bar. In other words, 
notwithstanding the fact that you've sought ethics advice, that's not a bar to engaging in. Not only sought it, but you right. got that's you right. got advice. That's right. But you know, we provided that information to the Office of Government Ethics, and their determination was it still should be referred to the Department of Justice. But given that this was a, a, a goof up on many levels that that compounded themselves, it's, it seems to have a very chilling impact on people in the future that maybe they can't necessarily rely upon this advice and not worry about their own situation a little more personally. But I think that's why it's very important that the ethics officer gives appropriate, consistent advice. And that's one of the reasons why we've made recommendations to the ethics office, because you're right. People are relying on this, and they need to make sure that they're getting the appropriate advice so they don't get into trouble because of something that somebody said that may not have been entirely accurate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Gentlemen, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Krauts, I'm going to follow up right where that left off. If I give you bad information about something I want an ethics opinion on and you give me a, a clear, clean bill of health, that, that doesn't preclude later recrimination, right? Absolutely, because in that case you could sort of use the process to get yourself out of some later recrimination. And ultimately, Mr. Becker, who we'll hear from later, is a senior attorney with independent knowledge of many things, including, quite frankly, he's a member of the bar. These are, these are independent actions which the Justice Department is going to look at whether he knew himself. Right. And, and in fact, he was the alternate designated agency ethics official. Thank you. You've taken me to the next question, which is inherently throughout government, not just in what Chairwoman Shapiro wants to fix, but throughout government, don't we have a need for a greater level of independence than, in fact, the head of all the lawyers, whom, in fact, may have lots of lawyers working with them and so on, who goes to another person that works for them for an ethics opinion. Isn't, isn't that a level of independence that is government-wide to be rethought by this committee? Yeah, I would think it would apply to other agencies as well. Absolutely. It's very hard to be completely independent when you are uh, subordinate to somebody, when they are reviewing and evaluating you. It's a very difficult thing to do. And from your uh, study, from your investigation, is there an inconsistency in this answer, in your opinion, that Mr. Becker got versus similar answers that somebody else would have gotten? Yes, we do relate some concerns we have about other individuals where even with respect to the Madoff liquidation, there was a much broader request to recuse. And while the, uh, with respect to Mr. Becker, uh, the determination was one aspect shouldn't necessarily impact the other. It, when it came to a uh, lower level staff attorney in the Office of General Counsel, just a, a small amount of work in her law firm on an unrelated bankruptcy matter, the determination was made she should be recused from all Madoff related activities. So they erred on the side of caution, except in the case of Mr. Becker. Th th yes, that was a concern, certainly. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, you oversee a great many public companies. Do those public companies have to declare contingent assets and contingent liabilities that, uh, that they have on their financial statements? In other words, under, under GAAP accounting, don't you have to actually disclose the fair contingent liability or contingent asset? If you sign, for example, famously, we're all looking at this in our companies, uh, and I do have some companies falling under some of these requirements. If you've got a lease, you've got a, you've got a value on that lease, even if you're making the payment every year. So you have to evaluate that. So all those contingent assets and liabilities, public accounting is trying to grapple with how to state them, correct? Even though they're not always liabilities that have any effect this year on the P&L. Right. In a sense, for this committee, and particularly for the Reform Committee that would be looking government-wide, Shouldn't ethics disclosures very much reach out and say, what are your contingent liabilities and your contingent assets? Do you ha are you the signer on your child's credit card? Are you the signer on your mother's home? Aren't those, in fact, things which could very much affect, just as Mr. Becker had a $140,000 or so dollar contingent, or $130-some-thousand dollar contingent windfall if he convinced a standard to be in his favor? I think it's a, a great question. I, I think some of that is actually already required to be disclosed. Some of the things that are not just personal to you, but to your spouse, to your children, 
trusts you might manage for a disabled um, a family member, those kinds of things. But I think it's very much worth looking at um, because anything right. that has the potential to create a conflict of interest, even if it's not directly right. owned by you, right. is something we should be looking at. Right. Mr. Cotts, was there any indication on Mr. Becker's uh, disclosure of this contingent uh, value or contingent liability if, if the Madoff clawback came in? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an excellent point. In this case, we found that the ethics official's advice was based on some incorrect assumptions, but we also found that there wasn't an effort to seek out that contingent information. In other words, there wasn't an effort when Mr. Becker came in and gave Mr. Lennox the information to try to understand exactly what this means. How will this impact things? What if this happens? What if that happens? Just like you're saying in a contingent fashion. Had he done that, he would have seen that there was this connection between what Mr. Becker was working on and his financial interest. So the candid disclosure that we expect from public companies didn't occur in this case? It did not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. And now the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. I want to just pick up where Mr. Issa left off. Um, let me make sure I understand this. Having represented a lot of lawyers in private practice, Mr. Coates, we had at least seven SEC officials had, that had been informed at one time or another about uh, Mr. Becker's mother estate account, including the chairman, the then deputy general counsel, the current general counsel, the deputy solicitor who testified at a hearing in Becker's stead, the director of the Office of Intergovernmental Legislative Affairs, the special counsel, to the chairman, and two ethics officials. Uh, but none of those individuals saw a duty to take further action to disclose Becker's interests to others at the SEC or to see, to see it that Becker recuse himself from the Madoff-related matters. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and Mr. Issa said something that was very interesting. He said, if somebody gives bad information, and I'm asking you because I'm sure Justice is looking at this hearing, are you saying that Mr. Becker gave any of these folks bad information? The reason why I'm, I'm getting at this is because I want to make sure, as other members of this panel have said, that it doesn't happen again and that we do, that your recommendations are able to catch these kinds of problems from happening again. But I can tell you, if seven people tell, tell my client to do something, assuming he hasn't given them bad information, I mean, i got to wonder about that. So you're saying that he – remember Mr. Isis talked about bad information. Are you saying that Becker either did not tell the truth, did not tell the whole truth? I mean, what are you saying? No. There was no information that Mr. Becker gave that was incorrect. Say that again. There was no specific information that Mr. Becker gave that was incorrect. With respect to five of those seven people, there was very limited information given. Okay. So there wasn't a lot of information upon which you might be able to make that determination. With respect to the ethics officials, there was more information given. The ethics officials had a misunderstanding, nevertheless, of the gravity of the situation. But, no, Mr. Becker did not provide any false information, per se. All right. And did um, – so and, – and one other thing you said that I was just wondering about, you talked about this whole thing of uh, people being subordinate, uh, that is, the, under him. And you all have – with the recommendations, I think we've gotten – we've addressed that. Is that correct? Is that a correct? Yes, they are planning to address that, yes. Okay. Is that, are you doing that? Uh... A absolutely. We will um, change the reporting line for the chief ethics officer. To and when is that going to happen? You, you keep saying we're going to. I thought uh, we oh, had done that. In a matter of however quickly I can get the commission approval to do it, but I would say in a matter of a couple of days. Oh, good, good. Would you let us know when that's done? Be happy to. Because I think that's very important. But uh, did you refer anybody else to the Justice Department? <coughs> No. For prosecution, possibly? No. no. I guess what I'm trying to get at is that you imply that somebody or somebody's, uh, because of their subordinate position, may have done something um, that was not proper. Was there any testimony uh, based on what you found of somebody saying, you know, because this Mr. Becker was uh, my superior, that I felt some kind of pressure or that I needed to do this? Or is this your conclusion? And, I'm, again, I'm just trying to figure out how this doesn't – make sure we don't have – that just happen again. 
Yeah, well, Mr. Lennox did not say that he felt pressure. He did say that uh, part of the factor that he used in making his determination was uh, how important it was for Mr. Becker, who he considered a very, very talented individual, to work on this specific significant matter for the commission. I see. And was the ethics advice provided to Mr. Becker by the SEC's Ethics Council at the time demonstrably flawed? I believe it was flawed, yes. And would you agree with that, uh, Ms. Shapiro? Well, I, I think that's actually now a question for the Department of Justice, um, given the referral. So I would be I understand. Uh, reluctant to answer that. But Congressman, could I just add one thing? Please do. About the other employees. Um, I think it's important to note that it wasn't they might have known a little bit. They, they might have had some um, understanding um, that Mr. Becker's mother had had an account, that he had received ethics clearance. Um, it wasn't their duty to opine on the ethics of, of what he was doing. And while I'm certainly not condoning anybody turning their back on a potential conflict, I'm not aware of any of those other employees having done that. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank the gentleman. And now the... Uh Vice Chair of the Committee, Mr. Fitzpatrick, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cotts, in his email to Mr. Becker, clearing him to work on the Madoff victim formula, uh, the SEC Ethics Council did not discuss whether it would create an appearance of a conflict if uh, Mr. Becker worked on the Madoff matters. Is a conflict of interest and an appearance of a conflict of interest the same, or are they different things? No, they're different, and uh, one should do a different analysis as to whether there's an actual conflict or whether there's an appearance issue. Can you expand on the differences between what the, how the sure, analysis Sure, and in fact, the, the, the same uh, ethics counsel in this case who did not state in the email to Mr. Becker that he was doing an appearance analysis actually issued an ethics newsgram where he talked about what the appearance analysis would be. And he actually did it in terms of the New York Times or Washington Post test. How would it look? What are the optics of the situation? What is the context of facts and circumstances? Would it pass what has often been referred to as the New York Times or Washington Post test? If what you propose doing becomes a subject of an article in the press, would you not care or would it not look like you were doing something wrong? Even if you wouldn't care, what effect would the story have on the SEC and your fellow employees? That was the test that Mr. Lennox himself set forth for appearances. That is very different from what the Justice Department is looking at with respect to an actual conflict. So what would have happened if Ethics Council found, which I believe any reasonable person would have seen, that there was an appearance of a conflict? At that point, there could have been a request made for an authorization or waiver for Mr. Becker to go forward and work on it, notwithstanding the concern. That would have had to have been elevated to the chairman of the agency to make a determination. All the facts would have had to have been disclosed to the chairman in order for her to properly determine whether that was appropriate. But that was not done here. And in fact, the, the, the appearance issue did not come up in the email, um, and there was never an opportunity to look at it further. Mr. Koss, are you familiar with um, the condition over the state of record keeping within the ethics office? Um, I, I do know that one of the recommendations we made that things be documented more. Uh, one of the things that the previous ethics counsel who gave the advice in this case said was he didn't document generally ethics advice. And we think in order to ensure that there's consistent advice given to different people, that there be some documentation. So you believe that deficiencies in record keeping could result in inconsistent advice? Yes. Were all the staff at the SEC treated the same? Well, we found that there were other instances of individuals who sought ethics advice about the Madoff liquidation matter who, for whom there was a much broader analysis and there was recusals in a much broader way than for Mr. Becker, which is why we had the concern with respect to Mr. Becker uh, and Mr. Lennox being a subordinate of Mr. Becker. So was there special treatment? Well, I believe that there was different uh, decisions made when it came to this decision with respect to Mr. Becker and when it came to decisions uh, with respect to other employees in the Office of General Counsel. And then if there was an appearance of a conflict of interest in the Becker case, could he have continued to work on the matter? If he had gotten a specific authorization or waiver to continue to work on that matter. And yes. that waiver would come from whom? The chairman. Nothing further. Thank you.
but the gentleman yield. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Cox, can you document the uh, Annette Nazareth situation uh, that you have that you mentioned in your report? Sure. Um, in May 2010, Annette Nazareth came forward. I'm sorry, May of 2009. Annette Nazareth, along with many other lawyers, uh, came forward and wrote a letter to David Becker uh, requesting that the SEC consider the so called last account statement approach. Under the last account statement approach, fictitious profits would be factored in. Essentially, Madoff victims would get compensation for the amount of their fictitious profits. That was a matter that David Becker looked at, analyzed, eventually rejected, uh, but it was brought forward by Annette Nazareth, who's a former commissioner of the SEC, and other uh, attorneys representing uh, Madoff victims. And she, in fact, knew that Mr. Becker uh, was heir to a Madoff account. Mr. Becker had informed Ms. Nazareth about his mother's estate's account, yes. Does that raise concerns? Uh, it did. It did, and, you know, we looked at that. We did not find uh, any evidence of preferential treatment for Ms. Nazareth. Um, but the appearance. But the appearance is something that it is a concern, and, and, and that's why, you know, all of Mr. Becker's activities in this matter have that appearance concern. And, and when you have a situation where you allow something to occur, even in the, sp in the space of an appearance issue, there becomes sort of a taint or a potential bias, and it, it erodes the credibility of the process, and that's exactly why these questions are asked. You know, the, the Washington Post-New York Times test is one to ensure that there isn't even the appearance of impropriety, and that was a concern in this case. Thank you. The gentleman's time has is, is, is expired. I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Maloney, the gentlewoman from New York. <coughs> Ch Chairwoman... Uh, Shapiro, according to the IG report, uh, Mr. Becker's alleged conflict of interest in the Madoff case arose primarily uh, due to his, and I quote, significant and leading role in the determination of what recommendations the staff would make to the commission regarding the position the SEC would advocate as the determination of a customer's net equity in the Madoff liquidation, end quote. So the method used to calculate net equity was and remains to this day a critical issue because it dictates how much each Madoff victim ultimately receives. So as one who represents many Madoff victims who lost their homes, lost everything, and are destitute. This is absolutely critical. Furthermore, for, for Mr. Becker's purposes, the method used to calculate net equity would likely determine whether or not he was subject to a clawback suit to recover the $1.5 in fictitious profits uh, credited by Madoff to his mother's uh, 500000 investment, which he then inherited in her estate. As noted earlier, Mr. Becker rejected the last account statement method, which was advocated by a number of Madoff clients, and if <coughs> adopted by the Madoff trustees, would have likely protected him from the current claw back suit of which he is now a party. Instead, he recommended that the commission adopt the so-called constant dollar method, which calculates each victim's net equity position as the amount they originally invested minus any withdrawals adjusted for inflation. The IG calculated that this approach would reduce by 138,000 the amount uh, sought in Mr. Becker, Becker's clawback uh, uh, suit. But the fact that Mr. Becker did not seem to be acting in pursuit of his own financial interest. I, I agree uh, with the IG's recommendation that the Commission should reconsider its position on this issue by conducting a revote in the process so that it is totally free of any taint or bias. And I commend you, uh, Chairwoman for Sh Sh Shapiro, for announcing, I believe, yesterday that you would call for such a vote, and uh, I think that's important. 
So I'd like to know, uh, when do you expect the commission to have this vote? I would be my hope um, that we could do it in the next several days. And uh, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. The changing the reporting lines in the next several days. We actually want to do more than just re-vote. We want to um, have a reanalysis of the issues. Um, this issue is not before the bankruptcy court yet. They've told us that they will set a briefing schedule for it uh, at some time uh, in the future. So we have a little bit of time, but uh, the staff will have to do a reanalysis and, and then we'll schedule for the commission. But we're, we've, I've already instructed that that reanalysis be started. Well, on Tuesday, you stated, and I quote, uh, that you believe the decision the commission made on the net equity issue was appropriate under the law and in the best interest of investors, end quote. However, even if the commission's outcome was appropriate, uh, we now know the process was flawed, and therefore you are calling for this revote uh, just to make sure the process is uh, not tainted but you agree with the outcome of the vote well, previously? I, I, I certainly agreed at the time that it was the most equitable way um, to treat uh, Madoff investors, that the final account statement method probably was not supported by the law, um, that cash in, cash out probably was, but there's generational unfairness because somebody who invested <coughs> very early on and is likely quite elderly and unable to earn back any of this money that was stolen from them would be at a disadvantage to a much more recent investor. So that's why constant dollars, um, which I think is permitted under the law, was appealing to me. All of that said, I obviously want to see the reanalysis before I would um, declare that I would be in exactly the same place, because I think it's important to make sure that the analysis is completely um, so, so you're taking additional steps to make exactly. sure the process was unbiased. Exactly. Inspector General, uh, do you have any additional recommendations uh, for the commission to, to ensure that we can have confidence in this vote and in this process in addition to what the chair lady has outlined? Yeah, well, we'd be happy to certainly play a role uh, in monitoring or, or uh, looking at that process of vote to ensure. I think it's actually a good thing that they're going to take their time to do it, to do a reanalysis. I think that the, uh, the recommendations and the discussion, the debate has to be done without the involvement of somebody with the potential bias or taint. And so I'd be happy to help in any way I can to ensure that that process is completely free of any taint or bias. General ladies, time has expired. Uh, with that, Mr. Gintz is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield my time to uh, back to the chair. Well, thank you. And uh, uh, Mr. Shapiro, I asked Mr. Koss this question about uh, former Commissioner Nazareth. She had knowledge of Mr. Becker's Madoff account. Uh, there was a letter that would, in standard form, be addressed to the chair of the SEC. She specifically addressed it to the general counsel. Um, uh, these things were noted in the IG's report. What are your thoughts on that process? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I should say that I did not know that she knew of Mr. Becker's mother's account until I read the IG's report. Um, what we, do you think now? of that situation? I, I guess I don't know what to, to think of it. it. I was surprised by it. Um, I believe that they are friends and, um, but I, was I don't it disappointing? Know. Did it reek of insider, you know, insider doing? N no, not, not to me. I mean, w you know, we have people who come back and one of the things the new ethics office does extremely well is counsel people on their post SEC employment obligations and requirements to disclose um, their, uh, the work that they're doing that might um, uh, have them appearing before the commission. Um, we do have people who have been at the agency who have left and come back, and so long as they follow the ethics rules uh, and, there is, um, and they don't come back within the prohibited time period, it's, it's a fact of life we live with. I think it's very important, and I think staff is quite attuned to this, that there be no special treatment ever for people right. who are former employees of the agency. So, but, you know, Ms. Nazareth knew of his account and knew what she was recommended would benefit him. That certainly has the appearance of impropriety, does it not? It, it, it's hard. It's, I'm sorry. It's just hard for me to, to judge that. I, um... Okay. Well, then let me ask you a different question, and I want to give you plenty of time to answer. 
you testified before that knowing now what uh, what you uh, you know had you known then what you know now you know and you've referenced that before and you've been very forthright about it tell me what you should have done or what you uh, would like to have done if you were able to rewind the clock walk walk us through that in hindsight because I th and the reason why I ask is and I ask you about your personal recusal you know, I, I'm not here I, we're not here uh, judging your ethics there's there is a uh, a decision made that we think was inappropriate, that the record shows uh, raised real questions. And, and so you've recused yourself on matters that weren't even of ethics violation. You just were concerned and you recused yourself. Um, so, so rewind and just walk us through that. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, it, even understanding that every employee's ethics obligations are their own, and this is a senior government attorney with lots of experience. Um, in hindsight, I wish I had asked questions. I wish I had, when he had said, my mother had an account, she died six years ago, it was closed. I wish I had thought to say, let's play this out. What are all the possible things that could happen down the road if we were thinking very aggressively and very creatively that could impact the fact that this account, which seems so remote to me when he told me about it, could have any implications whatsoever for your personal financial interests or for an appearance issue for the SEC as we deal with these issues. I, in hindsight, I wish I had asked more questions. Well, at the time, you were, you were coming in to, to clean up the SEC after dealing uh, with uh, all that came of the Madoff situation, you know, that, that this was an SEC failure, that, that they didn't see it happening. You had citizen watchdogs that said, uh, that tried to point this out to the SEC and the SEC didn't take action. So, you know, when the former chairman, Chairman Cox, said those on the SEC staff who even donated to a charity connected to the Madoff situation had to recuse themselves, do you think, in hindsight, you should have simply said, step aside simply because of the appearance? Well, I would say I wish I had known about Chairman Cox's memo to the staff. I, it was bef obviously before I arrived. Sure. He was still the chairman, and I didn't know about it. But I think, as I said, um, back in March when I testified that uh, in light of what, what I know now, and, and I, yes, I wish he had recused. Did you ask I wish I had thought to ask him to do that, but I, I didn't. Did you ask for the IG report before or after the hearing back in March? The, I believe before it was my um, before the hearing. Oh, okay. I, yes, I'm, I'm confident it was before the hearing. Okay, thank you. We could double thank check you. the days, but I'm confident. Okay. Uh, thank you for testimony. Uh, Mr. Miller, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My, my questions are not about Mr. Becker's conduct or the decision, uh, the investigation by the SEC uh, or the decision to refer, but about SEC's investigation of conduct generally um, and decisions to refer to the Department of Justice. Um, the speech at the Academy Awards by the producer of uh, Inside Job uh, can sound on it it's superficially like an appeal to mob rule. Why has nobody gone to jail? Uh, we don't put people in jail in this country because something went, uh, went real wrong and we need somebody to blame. Uh, politicized prosecutions really are incompatible with democracy and with the rule of law. Um, on the other hand, uh, the Teapot Dome scandal was in part about the ability to use uh, by political insiders to use their political clout to keep, uh, to keep a prosecution from happening. Uh, to protect people from prosecution who clearly were, were uh, guilty of criminal conduct. Uh, and the Supreme Court uh, at that time said that it was a proper role of Congress, to, uh, Congress's oversight powers, to investigate how the executive branch used criminal uh, prosecution powers. Um, there is now a lot of civil litigation pending around the country, I'm sure you're aware of it, arising out of mortgage securitization in the, in the last decade. Uh, the the uh, allegations in those, uh, in those lawsuits is pretty similar, and some of it seems to be very serious. Uh, and if true, it's hard to imagine that that does not rise to the level of crimes. Uh, there's now a lawsuit uh, in New York by MBIA and AMBAC to uh, mortgage insurers uh, against, well, it's against Chase, but for conduct at Bear Stearns that was later purchased by Chase. And the allegations are um, that Bear Stearns bought mortgages from the originators, 
put those mortgages in the pool, sold bonds based on the pools, no longer really had any interest in the mortgage, any beneficial interest in those mortgages, and at that point went back to the originators and said, those mortgages were not what you said they were. Uh, and we could require you to buy those back from us, but instead we'll settle for money. Uh, and they, they did settle for money. They kept the money and said not a word to the mortgage investors. Um, also, they allega the, the allegation is that their, their um, uh, due diligence firm, Clayton Holdings, uh, found lots and lots of mortgages that did not comply with the representations and warranties. Uh, and what they did was take those out of the pool because one in ten came, you know, they, they examined one in ten, but put them in the next pool knowing that exa exactly the same representations and warranties, knowing that those mortgages did not comply, uh, but figuring there's only one in ten chance that that mortgage would, would actually be examined by the due diligence firm. That appears to, to, those appear to be allegations of criminal conduct. Is the SEC investigating that conduct or the other similar allegations around the country? And if not, why not? Congressman, um, as you know, we don't have criminal authority, although we no, work closely. But you can investigate and refer. Uh, yes, and we do work very closely with the U.S. Attorney's offices around the country and state attorneys general. Um, I can tell you that we have um, a pipeline full of active cases coming out of the financial crisis that include issues around uh, the quality of mortgages that have been pooled, the adequacy of the disclosure about whether those uh, mortgages met the representations and warranties that were given. and. Um, We've brought a number of cases, about 70 um, coming out of the um, financial crisis, naming CEOs and CFOs, in fact. And uh, we'll continue to see those cases from the SEC. Um, we're moving very aggressively. Has the Inspector General's office looked at any of these, um, these decisions? Yeah, but that wouldn't be within our area. We, as the Inspector General's office, look at decisions uh, involving SEC employees. <coughs> I, I'm happy to explain the process we went through in determining to refer this matter to the Department of Justice. Uh, we essentially gathered the facts in this investigation and provided that information to the Office of Government Ethics. The Office of Government Ethics is the leading body that understands and interprets ethics matters. And obviously there were different factors to consider in this case. One being that was mentioned earlier that Mr. Becker sought ethics advice. Another that we didn't find evidence that Mr. Becker intentionally sought to uh, uh, financially profit from this. On the other hand, we were, there were concerns about his personal participation in a matter that could affect his financial interests. So we gathered up all the evidence. We provided it to the acting director of the Office of Government Ethics. He came back and recommended that we refer it to the Department of Justice for a potential criminal review. We felt it was our obligation that once the Office of Government Ethics indicated that it should be referred, that we do so. Gentlemen's time has expired. I uh, recognize uh, the Chairman of the Oversight Committee on Financial Services, uh, Mr. Randy Nagelbauer of Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Shapiro, uh, in Mr. Cott's report, he makes it clear that uh, in the Becker's, before Becker's arrival, that the Commission had been t twice briefed on the money in, money out uh, proposition, uh, and that, uh, that the CIPIC payout plan would, would follow that. And that, uh, according to um, Steve Harbeck, he went so far as to say that the SEC had, you know, in, in, in SIPC had verbally agreed to move forward uh, with the money in, money out method. Yet, shortly after Mr. Becker uh, arrived, uh, the Commission made a 180 degree turn. Can, can you explain why? Uh, that happened in, in Mr. Becker's influence on that process? I think it's correct to say that very early on in the process, um, the Commission was generally comfortable with money in, money out, and that was the recommendation <coughs> of the staff uh, in trading and markets. But um, what coincided, actually, I believe, with um, roughly with Mr. Becker's arrival at the Commission is lots of victims coming forward and um, through letters and emails and other ways. Um, uh, very, very unhappy, profoundly unhappy about money in, money out because it limited um, the amount of their recovery and, and really pushing very hard for the Commission to consider whether final account statement was a better way to calculate net equity. Um, I think it's incumbent upon us as a government to not just say, forget it, we've already made up our minds, and even though you might be bringing us a new theory, a new legal theory, a new idea, we're not going to listen to you. 
Um, and so the commission took the time to hear out um, those victims and understand their legal arguments. We concluded nonetheless at the end of the day that money in, money out was the right way to go, uh, that final account statement wasn't appropriate. But I, I think we have an obligation to hear, to hear people. And, in, in, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I uh, kind of wonder from your earlier testimony, you said you didn't think about whether Mr. Becker got counted, you know, lost or made money, didn't, it really didn't dawn on you. But, you know, if you were familiar with uh, Mr. Madoff's scheme, everybody always made money. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, if you got out early, then every, those people that got out early, you know, sh showed in many cases substantial gains. In fact, Mr. Becker's uh, p uh, family account, I think, started off with an initial investment of $500,000, and and I think when they cashed it in, it was was two million dollars. Uh, and so, you know, so from a perspective of looking at a, a different uh, settlement matter, basically for those people that got out early. Uh, meant that, that that changed the clawback calculation. I mean, did it, did, I'm, I'm having a hard time. I mean, you're a very smart person, and you've been in this business a long time. I mean, didn't it, it just, when you keep telling me it didn't dawn on you that that there was an issue here, I, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. I, I didn't know when the account was open. I didn't know how much was put in. I didn't know how much was taken out. Um, at the time it was liquidated because apparently it was liquidated as a result of a death. I, I just, I had none of that information. Um, of course, we all know that Ponzi schemes do make money until they don't anymore, but I had no sense of how long it had been open, what had been deposited, and what had been withdrawn. It just was not information that I had. So when Mr. When Mr. Becker said, you know, uh, uh, my, my family had a, an account with Madoff, uh, Early in that process, it didn't cross your mind to say, "Are we? How much money are we talking about here? Are we talking about, you know, two hundred and fifty dollars, two point five million? I mean, it didn't dawn on you to say, you know, I'm, I'm, because I I know I understand your frustration, but it didn't. To me, it was an a, an account of a deceased relative from five or six years ago. It just didn't seem to have a live financial component to it to me at that time as we were dealing with all these other issues. So, so the, when Mr. Becker then later on in the process, when he was, when he was, uh, he, there's some accounts of some conversations that you had, and I think after uh, it was determined he shouldn't uh, uh, testify because of, of, of the conflict, uh, you said, quote, I believe it's, don't worry, you'll have other opportunities. I mean, y'all were kind of making light of the fact that he didn't get to t testify. At, at that point in time, did, did, did you have regular, did, hadn't it not dawned on you then? Or, I mean, when did it dawn on you, I guess is what I'm saying. It, after after the, 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 the uh, when the newspaper account came out, did it dawn on you then or did it dawn on you before then? Well, well, I, obviously, when I read that he'd been sued um, in a clawback suit, it, it very clearly dawned on me, and um, which is why I, I asked the Inspector General to look at it. It did not occur to me at the time um, that there would be that he would have a personal financial interest in how this issue was resolved. I had nothing to gain by this. I, I, I know that. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to. I'm trying to make sense of it. Really, is what I'm trying to do because, uh, it, it, quite honestly. A lot of this, it just seems so common sense uh, that uh, it, through this whole process that, uh, you know, it, it raises the question of, you know, if, if, if these kinds of things are falling through the cracks, are there other kinds of things that are falling through the cracks here that, that we, we haven't, hasn't come to light yet that we're just quite not, not aware of? I mean, do you, do you follow what I'm saying? I, I do. I, I won't tell you there are no, there's nothing going wrong. Um, anywhere in the SEC at any given moment, but I will tell you that we have worked tirelessly to improve the operations of the agency in, in almost every aspect of it, and I think we have tremendous results to show for that. I thank you. Thank you. Expired. Gentleman from New York, Mr. Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I must confess, uh, I'm not totally amazed. Uh, as with almost anything made off, uh, nothing is really what it seems. 
Um, and it's quite understandable once you view the entire picture of what is, what isn't going on, and how, how easy it was to miss so much of this. Um, it's, it seems to me, though, in, in all fairness, that this appears to be, from what everybody has looked at, uh, a pretty isolated case within the agency uh, with very limited damage, most likely, done, if <coughs> any damage whatsoever. Uh, this is everything being relative. I think we're going to find, from what I've read, from what Mr. Becker has said and from my conversation with him some time ago, uh, that he is a fairly substantial financially person from a fairly su substantial family. And the amounts of money that he might have even benefited from is a relatively, if I could use the word, piddling amount compared to the net worth of, of what he's looking at. Um, I, I do have some concerns, though, about what it looks like from an ethical point of view. Um, in the Annette Nazareth case, he actually turned down the opportunity to agree with her argument and those of her clients that would have, had he accepted those arguments, benefited him to the tune of one and a half million dollars. Instead, he came down on the side, as did, as did you, that it appeared that the reasonable way to go was with money in, money out, plus the cost of constant dollars at the time, which would have benefited him, as I understand the back of the envelope calculation shows, $138,500, which in Mr. Becker's circumstance, having been a person who took a 90% cut in salary to take the job, assuming he's making $200,000 a year in this position, meant he was making $2 million a year previously, which my calculator says he makes up in 24.9 days. Had he done this for the money, he would have worked a month longer in his old job instead of taking this one. Um, question of judgment, yes. Uh, my, my question is, as a result of his not recusing himself, was there any damage done to anybody at all? I think um, no, I think the answer to that is the damage done is unfortunately to Mr. Becker's reputation, and he is a fine and lawyer. And the agency. And and a committed and a, was a committed public servant, and to the agency, and the time that we are all spending um, sorting through I, these issues. The, the decision made to to switch him out as a witness. Is, is troubling to me. Um, as, as I'm sure you will recall, there was a hearing shortly, I think it was the week of your becoming a chairperson. Um, and it was a disaster of a hearing, I think, uh, from the point of view of the witnesses that were testifying, and there was a lot of acrimony going on. And by the time I reached my office that day, there was a message from you expressing that you were aghast at the way top people in the agency conducted themselves before our congressional committee and said you were going to clean that up. And that was like on a Wednesday. And I went home for the weekend and saw in the newspapers on Sunday that you had fired almost everybody that was at that table because of the way they conducted themselves before this Congress. And I have to tell you that I was impressed and remain impressed with, with what you do. So I, I have a concern about switching out the witnesses because of the fact, as, as I believe you stated he would have been a distraction in having to reveal that he had a conflict of interest or that he had a Madoff account. Is that distraction because, well, not doing that has caused this whole distraction. Uh, is, is that because Congress would have now known and, and exercised its oversight no, earlier? No, not, not at all, Congressman. Um, we didn't think there was a conflict, and recall that he, he at the, our legislative affairs office knew that he had, in fact, been cleared by ethics and determined not to have a conflict. But I believe there was a worry that it would take away from the focus. But his not having, yeah, we, we, we might have probed it a lot more 
not having to report to him, we might have probed it in a different way than the Ethics Council advised him that he didn't have a conflict. I, I guess that's possible. It just it, it didn't occur to me. We had a, um, an actually a better witness um, for, for the subject matter, someone who was very involved with CIPIC on the liquidation issues. I think there was a concern that if you have two great witnesses or one great witness and one good witness, you pick the one who does not have personal circumstances that can be distracting because this was the Commission's witness to speak to the Commission's uh, legal and policy analysis. And, and so um, I was genuinely, I believe, a concern um, that it not distract from the important substance of what the committee was, the subcommittee was going to be discussing at that hearing. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. I recognize myself for five minutes. Um, Mr. Kotz, the criminal conflict statute, does it require uh, uh, a large or small financial interest for it to be applicable? What would, will you explain that to us? Uh, no, it does not. Uh, there's no uh, requirement that it be over a certain sum. Uh, any sum at all where there is a potential conflict is uh, a potential criminal matter. Even if you're working against your own financial interest? That's right. Uh, in addition to that fact that I just mentioned, uh, it is irrelevant for ethics purposes whether you are working for or against your interest. You're not supposed to be involved in a matter that affects your financial interest, whether it's pro or con. So in this, in this light, it doesn't matter if the gentleman had a high net worth or a low net worth, if you made a high salary or a low salary. <coughs> Is that correct? For the purposes of an ethics analysis, that's correct, yes. Okay. And what I would say furthermore is it, it goes beyond just one individual's reputation. It goes to the trust and the reputation of the agency and institution that they're a part of. Um, you know, I, th there is time, and I have time, and my, th the last question here for this panel and the last three minutes for the panel. Ms. Shapiro, I'll give you uh, an opportunity to say whatever you didn't get an opportunity to say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think um, look, this is a, a tragic series of events. Um, I think we have taken um, great strides here to improve the operations of the Ethics Office of the SEC. Um, we have um, tremendous new personnel there, very talented, very sophisticated, very, very committed, very tough and aggressive in their interpretation of the uh, <coughs> ethics rules. And I, I feel confident that we have in place the processes and the procedures that will help us prevent something like this from happening again. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Koss, do you have a statement you want to, any cleanup you want to make? No, I mean, I appreciate the fact that uh, the uh, chairman is implementing our plans to implement all our recommendations. Uh, I would say that, as I said in my opening statement, uh, the process worked with respect to the inspector general's office in this case. Uh, the chairman asked us to do an investigation. We did an investigation in a timely manner. The information was brought out there and there are going to be changes to the SEC's operations as a result. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Capuano, uh, Mr. Garrett just arrived, so he's entitled to five minutes. Okay. Mr. Garrett is recognized for five minutes. And I thank you. I appreciate the chair. So um, a lot has been made by some, at least, uh, Mr. Becker, through his conflict of interest on the Madoff-related matter and participation in SEC policy responses <coughs> regarding Madoff victim compensation, stood to gain personally from the compensation proposal put forward by the SEC versus the one put forward by the by CIPIC and its trustees. The SEC proposal was not adopted by CIPIC trustee proposal, however. One reason it may not have been adopted, even though, as Mr. Cott's testimony alludes to, is the SEC has the power to overrule CIPIC. It's because CIPIC's CEO knew of Mr. Becker's conflict of interest and used this leverage to keep the SEC from, well, what, more aggressively pursuing its alternative net equity formulation. Additionally, while much has been made of Mr. Becker's conflict of interest, no one that I'm aware of has focused on the major conflict of interest that CIPIC and its trustee has in formulating a net equity formula for made us victims compensation. CIPIC, obviously, on behalf of its member broker-dealers, wants to protect uh, its fund from being drained. 
understandable, so would have an interest in a formula that was less protective of the victims. The trustee has an interest in the formula as well. He has an interest to have a formula that produces a lot of litigation, which does what? Then drives up um, his and I guess his firm's fees as well. Now, a clawback heavy formula, which the trustee ultimately adopted, is indeed very lawyer intensive, and by the trustee's own calculation, his firm will ultimately bill over $1 billion for the Madoff liquidation. So my question then is, in your investigation, um, Scotts, did you go down this road that we're talking about here in any way to investigate SIPC and his trustees, what some would say is a clear conflict of interest in this case? Uh, we did not. Our, uh, our jurisdictional purview is that of SEC employees. Uh, we did not look at the issue of a potential conflict of interest on the part of SIPC uh, in this case. Okay. Um, so you, what you're saying, it's out, well, yeah, I guess you're saying it's, a, it's outside of your purview, outside your authority, would you? Right. My job as Inspector General is to conduct investigations and audits of SEC employees and contractors. Uh, we would not conduct normally an investigation of someone who doesn't work for the SEC. All right. So, and so how about then investigating Mr. Harbeck's use of his knowledge of Mr. Becker's financial interest? Yeah, well, we weren't aware that Mr. Harbeck was aware of uh, Mr. Becker's financial interest. While we did interview Mr. Harbeck in this investigation, uh, he indicated to us that he was not aware of Mr. Becker's uh, personal interest until it was reported in the press. S all right. So you were not okay. So you were not aware of it um, from information provided to you, or uh, is is there? Yeah, I mean, I have a not back, heard a back of the a back of the envelope, I guess, approach to see whether there was be a, an interest in. Yeah, I mean, I have not heard before of this allegation that Mr. Harbeck was aware of Mr. Becker's interest and there was a conflict of interest as a result. Uh, this is the first I'm hearing of it, uh, and because I I wasn't aware of that allegation, we didn't have any evidence. Although we didn't look for that in this case. I understand. It wasn't part of our investigation. So did you? In well, I guess I know the answer, but did, but I'll ask you: Did you investigate the trustee's interest then in the potential for p compensation as being a um, uh, a factor or a potential driving fa driving factor in the equity formula that he was advocating? We didn't look at the entire process of how either the trustee or SIPC arrived at their partic particular approach. We looked specifically uh, at the conduct of Mr. Becker, who was an SEC employee. I see. All right. So, so clearly then the uh, SIPA did not intend the finan financial conditions of SIPIC to derive the handling of the victim's claim, not before, but after the failure of, uh, of the regulator broker dealer as a result of the fraud then. Yeah, I mean, again, I don't know, I can't say with certainty what SIPIC's motivations were either way because that wasn't an issue that we looked at in the I got investigation. You. All, right. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Let's say this. And the, the, the study, the GAO study that I've requested will then hopefully shed some more light on some of these issues, um, not only for me, but then the SEC will also benefit from that information and should then, therefore, I would think, defer its reconsideration vote on the next equity until the report is complete. Um, do I see you shaking your head? No, I just I hadn't thought about that, and I wasn't sure when the GAO report was uh, due. Okay. So do you... Even though not knowing, what, what, what do you think you, you want to uh, do then? I guess I'd like to think about that. Um, okay. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, well, I, I, think, I, 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 thank, uh, I thank the chairman of the Capital Markets Subcommittee. Uh, I want to thank the panel uh, for your testimony. Thank you for your service to our government, to our people. Uh, thank you for your time today. The, this panel is dismissed. We will recess for votes, at which point we will take testimony from Mr. Becker and have a series of questions.